corner, I want to take a minute to thank everyone who has supported the museum uh, throughout this pandemic, whether it's by attending one of our virtual programs like this, um, or just calling the staff to make sure that we're all doing okay. Uh, it's really, really appreciated. And if you're wondering about how you can contribute uh, continue to support us at this time, I would encourage everyone in attendance to consider making a small donation or even just purchasing a membership um, as that, that's one of the easiest ways to help us sustain operations at this time. Now, I wanna jump right into introducing today's speakers. So when I say your name, uh, if you could just kind of give a wave uh, so the audience knows who you are, that would be great. Uh, so Anne Babrav Hajal paints detailed and whimsical visual stories about powerful human motivations, love, greed, grief, competition, fury, as shaped by the geographic landscapes on which those humans live. In her large icon-like satirical mixed media polyptics about Russia, she has developed a complex process of repeated layering on digital images of her own paintings and of photographs. Her current exhibition, Playground of the Autocrats, is on view uh, at the museum through January 21st, 2021. To learn more about the exhibition uh, and sort of why we had this program today, uh, please visit the museum's YouTube page uh, to watch an interview with Anne and a couple of other videos uh, related to the exhibition. And then kicking off today's program is uh, Elizabeth Wood. Uh, Elizabeth A. Wood is Professor of Russian and Soviet History at MIT, where she also directs the Russian Studies Program and the MIT Russia Program. Her current research focuses on the political performances of the Russian President Vladimir Putin, as well as on the gender policies of the early Soviet state in the 1920s. Her major publications include The Baba and the Comrade, Gender and Politics and Revolutionary Russia, Performing Justice, Agitation Trials in Early Soviet Russia, and Roots of Russia's War in Ukraine, which he co-authored in 2016. So with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth Wood. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Amy. That was a wonderful introduction. And um, I'm delighted and honored to be here to be speaking at the Museum of Russian Icons, even if we're not really there, and to be sharing the floor with Anne Babrov Hajal, who I've known for many years and uh, whose work I think is amazing. So I think I hope everybody uh, will enjoy today's hour or hour and a half. Um, so my talk is called Gender and Imagination in the Russian Civil War, Forward Looking Men and Backward Women in iconic perspective, 1917 to 1922. The 1917 Russian Revolution has been viewed in many ways, but today I want to think about it as a revolution to leave behind the detested autocratic regime and to overcome backwardness. During the civil war that followed the revolution, the new authorities hired dozens of artists to create posters that were intended to mobilize the population and to address social ills. Among these social ills was the problem of gender inequality. In theory, women were now to be made equal in voting, land ownership, marriage, divorce, alimony, and in whether their children were legitimate or illegitimate. But what about in visual representation? Naturally, Civil War era visual propaganda tended to be schematic by its very nature. It was created during an era of intense fighting on many fronts, and the imagery had to be quickly grasped by its citizens on the go. Nonetheless, I think it is fair to argue that the posters intensified gender differences more even than might have been expected in wartime. Artists, as I hope to show today, tended to portray male figures with outstretched arms, eyes forward, and wide strides to exemplify the forward positive impulse to build a new society and the call to fight. Forward, the phrase itself, had been used in countless journals and newspaper um, articles and even the names of some of the journals in the years leading up to the revolution. Forward was the symbol of, was one of the key phrases for revolution. Female figures, by contrast, as you'll see today, were shown looking backward over their shoulders, engaged in outdated practices and associated with bad mothering, illiteracy, prostitution and abortion, all of which represented the desperate backwardness that needed to be transformed. What's interesting to show in this context is that both men's and to a lesser extent women's Im images also drew heavily on the icons of the Russian Orthodox Church. To portray men as the warrior saints of the new era and women, as I say to a lesser extent, as the mothers of the revolution. As we will see, the warrior images in particular contain classic components of icons, coloration, composition, and constituent elements. This is all rather surprising given that the early Soviet state was officially militantly atheistic and secular. 
The surface reasons for this iconic portrayal of male subject can be found relatively easy. Easily, many early Soviet artists had trained in the classic art. They um, thought of using religious art to attract viewers. And of course, icons were well known and highly readable for largely illiterate audiences. But I think I think it's also important to think about what historian Vicky Bonnell called the Bolsheviks privileging of the eye, which she equated with what Russian Orthodox Church specialists call the ocular centrism of the Orthodox Church. So the uh, tendency to attract, to use, give primacy to visual materials as a way of conveying theology. Rather than having elaborate theological points, you showed through imagery that could be thought about in great detail, as the museum has done. The museum has, has lots of talks, and, and, and if you go to their website, quite extraordinary uh, articles about how to read icons. What, what I don't know, what we don't know, is whether the artists repurposing iconic elements that I'm going to show today did so consciously or unconsciously, um, I think not unconsciously, you'll see, whether they themselves found them beautiful, I suspect they may have, or they thought they would better reach their target populations. That's also possible. Whatever the reason for the visuality of the Bolshevik propaganda, these icon-based posters of warriors reinforce the visual, and I would argue, apparently intuitive nature of the materials. And that in turn reinforced pre-revolutionary unexamined assumptions about gender dichotomies and roles in society. So let's look at some images. That's the fun part. Um, I just wanted to give you a little introduction. Okay, so once the Bolsheviks seized power in October 25th, on October 25th, 1917, the leaders sought to implement a new social contract between the people and the authorities. What has the October Revolution given the woman worker and peasant? This was one of the most famous paintings, posters. It's one I used on the cover of my own first book. It's a, one that I've always loved. But what's interesting is to think about it in this question of how is it constructed and looking at it closely, I realize that the main subject is the October Revolution. In Russian, what has the October Revolution given to the woman worker and uh, peasant? Um, here, the leading woman, you can see her in the center, uh, gestures toward a library, a cafeteria, a workers club, and so on. She wears a blacksmith's apron, I think, although you might think it's a kitchen apron, I'm not positive. She holds a hammer, but she also wears a dress and she has feminine boots. Um, a sickle at her feet implies that she has left behind the peasant life in favor of the workers. So on the surface, she appears a, um, a, a, the epitome of androgyny, a figure combining female and male qualities. She's also one of only very few female figures to take an active stance. She stands in the sunshine, a typical religious symbol of salvation, pointing to all the new institutions. She also reminds the viewer of women's and society's debt toward this all granting revolutionary state. As Jeffrey Brooks, another historian has pointed out in Thank You Comrade Stalin, much of the early rhetoric of the revolutionary state claimed the high moral ground, making quote, the people indebted to the leaders. The communist party would help women learn what it was, what was in their interests. The October revolution would give and women would receive. It is the October Revolution, a female noun, that gives, and the woman worker who acts as the messenger. And I think this is interesting. I'm not going to say too much about this, but the other um, icon that, oops, why am I, okay, sorry, uh, that this goes with is, of course, the mother of God, who also points to the Christ child. So we see that in a way, we think of this image as the center because that's the way we're used to seeing pictures. She's the main picture, but she's pointing to the new world with the sun coming down on her face, just as the mother of God, who is central to iconography, points to the real center, which is the Christ child. So now let's look at some um, male images. The vast majority of uh, the most famous pictures show men, um, and I had to go looking to find more pictures of women. Um, in a year of proletarian dictatorship, we see a male worker, and so we have a, a male worker and a male peasant guarding the gates of heaven with the sun streaming and the people pouring through to come toward the viewer into this new heaven. In the next slide, oops, um, proletarians of all countries unite um, a male, we see a male soldier, a male peasant, and a male uh, worker combining under the red star, which has a, um, actually has a hammer and a plow in it. Um, in the next image, let me see if I can get, no, I can't. Um, 
we see, you know, this is what I mean by forward, forward to the defense of the Urals, um, man running forward with a bayonet at full charge. Um, when women do appear, and as they do in this image of the 1st of May, 1920, uh, we see three figures. We see the male peasant with his scythe, the male worker with his hammer and the woman, but she's a step behind and with uh, her sickle at her side, they are stepping over the, the vestiges of capitalism. It says through the fragments of capitalism to the international brotherhood of laborers in Russian bratstvo cannot be a neutral noun. Sometimes it might, you might think, oh, comrades are neutral, but brothers are definitely brothers. So it's that they're stepping forward to the brotherhood of laborers. In the next image, we see long live the Komsomol um, uh, toward the seventh anniversary of the October Revolution. Um, and what I think is very interesting about this image is that the man is facing resolutely forward, carrying the banner himself. It's a red banner. Um, banners were often show up in icons as the military banners. The woman looks backwards. She's what inspired me in part to think of calling this the backward, the backward looking woman. What's really striking though, is not only that she looks backwards, she has the peasant kerchief on, she's barefoot. He has shoes, she's barefoot. So I don't wanna to make too much of that, but I think it is interesting that she's identified with the peasant. Some of this is the schematic nature of the posters, but some of this is also the ways of thinking as women as backwards. So let's turn now to some more iconic images. Um, if we look closely at some of the images of male fighters, we see that they have um, often include uh, the image of the blacksmith, but what's, who's a icon of Western European socialist traditions and has that's been written about before. But what I think is so interesting is the way in which images such as this one, long live the red army, draw on images of Archangel Michael and St. George, winged horses, halos, red banners, holy banners, medieval cities and fortresses. These larger than male life figures employ a masculinity of the warrior saint um, who will emerge victorious in, from battle. Here we see, um, you can see immediately. So the red star was itself a symbol of the church. We think of it as the Soviet Im image because that's the most recent history, but in fact, uh, churches often had red stars on them. We see he has a red horse, which is symbolic of the Archangel Michael. Archangel Michael was the leader of the holy uh, troops, both the uh, angelic troops in the great battle of good and evil and the, sec the uh, earthly troops. So here we have the um, long live the red army. Of course it's red, for that reason, but it's also red because it's the Archangel Michael. We have the winged figure, we have the star, we have the banner, and we have the city of Moscow in flames below the Kremlin. It could be any Kremlin, I suppose. And the host of warriors, holy warriors with their spears outstretched. So if we look ahead, we can see this relates to the um, one of the images of the um, the most famous of the icons in the in the world, in the Russian world anyway, is blessed is the host of the heavenly czar icon, a seven foot long icon that uh, was originally in the Dormition Chapel in the heart of the of the Moscow Kremlin. So the heart of the heart of Russia. Um, and here, I'm gonna show you one a close up of this. We see Archangel Michael in the holy, um, this is, in technically called the mandorla. It's not, usually a mandorla is in the shape of an almond, but it can be circular. The double circle that represents his um, holy status. He's leading the troops um, on the far right. I don't know if you can still see it. The, um, the uh, it's, it doesn't matter. The, they're away from Kazan. It's the victory of Ivan the Terrible, leading the troops to the holy city of Moscow, which is represented as Jerusalem with the mother of God, giving the child, the Christ child, crowns to anoint the martyrs of the revolution. So um, if we look again at these two images together, we can see how this has the city of Moscow, the troops with their spears and the um, winged uh, archangel. Now we'll take another iconic image. I hope you'll see this and many of you may know more about icons than I do. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. 
this is also something and at first glance doesn't necessarily look iconic, right? Um, Dimitri Moore did this, who's a famous artist, did this poster. Soviet power is a besieged camp, everyone to the defense. Um, two workers in the center and a peasant examine a map. Um, the What's interesting is that the um, star is upside down. It's pointing downward. And if you know Russian iconography, the downward facing a star is the symbol of Christ coming to earth, the Sashestvye of Mir in Russian. We see this in Andrei Rublev's The Transfiguration, Christ in the green circle, we've got a green circle here, with a black star pointing down for the transfiguration as he appeared to his disciples below with Moses and Elijah on his sides. Then we can look and we see that Christ in majesty, oops, I'm sorry, I have to, anyway, um, Christ in Majesty, this is actually the image that's in the Museum of Russian Icons. Um, I took it from their website. Uh, we see that Christ is shown with both, in Majesty is both the red, uh, it's not a star, but it's nonetheless a red geometric shape surrounded by a green one, um, as we have the red and the green here. And the same appears in the mother of God at the unburning bush. This may not be an icon that's familiar to those of you who are not super uh, Russian Orthodox icon fans, but it will be well known to those of you who are from the museum or connected to the museum. Um, the story is the, uh, the mother of God connects her to Moses and the unburning bush. Um, and it's an eight pointed star, which shows uh, eternity, um, the number eight. It also has the red and green colors, the red for the bush, which could not be consumed and the green uh, the, for the fire that does not consume and the green for the bush. And here we see the fire and the green. And the, also we see again, I, I didn't show, I forgot to show this on the other one. We see a halo up above and we see the three figures at the center. Um, what's especially interesting then is to take do a close up of the three figures in the center. I just figured this out uh, very recently. We see Andrei Rublev's famous uh, Trinity of the Old Testament with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here we have a worker and a peasant framing the, the communist in the center. They are looking down at the map in the center. So we replace the chalice in the center with a map in the center. The, the uh, strings up here are pointing to places on the map. The worker and the peasant are both very simple, just red uh, shirts. The, um, the communist is on the phone. He has a cap. Um, he's the center figure. And what icon specialists say is that God the Father uh, presages God the Son and the Spirit. There's a, sort of a temporal element, the before and after, the, but both in a way leading to the central figure. Here, the central figure is the communist. So um, it's uh, we, we, once you start looking at these things, you start seeing all kinds of things. Um, another icon of, from not icon, but another poster from this period is Welcome Comrades, Long Live the Third International. It, proves its internationality by having words in all different languages. Um, it, he, uh, has, he's the blacksmith, uh, the, the socialist icon with his outstretched arm against the background of the anvil. But to my eyes, because of the Kremlin here in red, the color red here, and this is maybe far-fetched, but I still think it's worth thinking about, is he Moses and the burning bush? I don't know. Uh, It'd be interesting to see what, what you think in your question and answer, if you want to talk about it. Um, here's a, the battle of the red knight against the dark forces. We see the Manichaean imagery of the good knight against the evil forces. The dark, uh, the dark is the, of course, in iconography is always uh, evil. Here, though, he has a hammer at the top and his uh, shield has the, the hammer and sickle of the, um, of the new Soviet state. This, of course, is not Archangel Michael, but Archangel is but Saint George. Saint George has the white horse with the lance pointing down, defeating the the serpent or the uh, monster of evil forces. This one has a folk image, and as you notice, it's not as iconic in in its general kind of. It also relates to a famous painter of the day, Vasily. Oops, I'm sorry, typo there. Vasily Vasnetsov. I had it in Russian. I changed it to English. It's supposed to say "Warrior's Leap" in Russian. It says "Bogatyr's Leap." A Bogatyr was an ancient warrior. Um, so uh, clearly, um, the 
artist here is inspired by this notion of the dramatic horse riding forward into battle against the forces of evil who have come down below. Um, so th there are many more images I don't want to go on too long, but I'll end the sort of um, men's side of the story with uh, Trotsky spearing the um, dragon of counter-revolution. We see Trotsky here in his armor. He's got the lance, the spear, and he comes down against this great counter-revolutionary dragon. It even says counter-revolution in, in Russian, who is wearing the top hat of capitalism. Um, so we see here again, St. George um, spearing the, the dragon of, of the enemy. So in summary, if we look at these male figures, we can see them as holy warriors and blacksmiths actively strongly fighting for the revolution and forging the new, re forging the new revolution. They take on the banner of Christ as uh, the Lord of the world, was, um, stepping powerfully into the new world. They bear the banners that symbolize victory uh, associated with horsemen, uh, Archangel Michael and the spearing the dragon as St. George. But what about women? Um, early Soviet socialists were, of course, well aware of the image of the European symbol of revolution, the Marianne figure. She is the uh, symbol of, of the French Revolution. Um, I searched hard for some Mariannes and found this one. There's one other that was so uninteresting, I didn't put it in, but um, it says, glory to the great anniversary of the proletarian revolution, showing a rather masculine looking woman, strong muscles, um, hair that is sort of Gorgon-like, uh, Roman attributes, but it's Roman, absolutely, instead of being Russian um, Orthodox. Um, we have a more militant woman, you know, this question of are women going forward? She is handing the rifle, take up your rifles, but this again, I would say nothing iconic about her. She's handing the rifle. I don't believe she's ready to shoot it. And she's got a polka dotted blouse that doesn't speak the same warrior image that the men have, even though, and I can talk about this if people are interested, uh, women were supposed to also receive some military training, especially um, communist women. Um, women are usually the victims. In wartime, perhaps this isn't so surprising. Here we have retreating from the Red Army. The white guards burn the grain. They're also burning the house. And she, surrounded by the children and the elderly, is imploring them not to. to and they, of course, are fat um, priest and white general with no mercy. They have the active figures. She is actively reaching, but she's clearly a victim. The next image, I hope you won't be too horrified, shows Ukraine as the, the ultimate victim. Here we have uh, the executioners are tearing apart Ukraine. I find this image uh, very moving. Um, Ukraine is being nailed to the cross in the face of Polish uh, attackers. The top one is says Pan, which means the Polish um, lord or rich guy. And below is Petliora, the Polish general. Um, the, the, the executioners are tearing apart Ukraine, death to the executioners. So it's drawing on our, our sympathy for, for the woman as the victim. Um, not too surprisingly, the, um, we see the woman as the red, as the nurse, nursing the Red Army soldier. The wounded Red Army soldier will find himself a mother and a sister in every working woman. This one I think is iconic in undoubtedly, here we see the Pieta. In Russian, it's called the aplakivanye, which means the lamentation. Um, we definitely see um, figures falling here where we have angels up here, but it's unquestionably the pose is actually identical to the mother of God nurturing, um, Mary nurturing uh, Jesus at, um, as the figure. And here's a second one showing the day of the red arm, wounded Red Army soldier. Again, he's the center. She's nursing him. We have also an iconic uh, progression from the old world with the peasant pulling the wooden plow through the dirt. He's, he represents the past that we want to get behind, get a move forward from. And here's the new world with the institution that has nurtured. There's a, you can, I don't know if you can see it. There's a tiny uh, wounded man there with a nurse next to him. And I think the goal is to show that the Soviet institutions will lead um, the will take care of the wounded soldier and move him, move things forward. So um, here we have an image of 
uh, the peasant woman who was supposed to be prepared to go from the old life to the new. Uh, she stands at the center of a triangular image wearing the, the um, woman workers, uh, uh, um, back to the woman peasants, I'm sorry, the woman peasants red scarf, but the main message she has is fulfill the commandments of Ilyich. Ilyich, of course, is Vladimir Lenin. She's supposed to move away from the old world of the church and the old world of the Damastroi, which was the medieval commandments that women should be subordinate to men. Um, and it shows her bright future, but it does say that it's Soviet power that gave women equal rights and therefore she should move into the new order and not fall behind, um, because she is following the commandments and of course of, of Lenin. And the commandments of course are the religious word. We think of it as they are both the Ten Commandments, and in Russian, they are the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. So commandment and testament are the same word, zavieti. So she's supposed to follow those commands. Um, and here's just quickly some um, negative images of women. Here is the harm done from the abortion done by a babka. She's the village healer. Here's the bad babka um, persuading the woman to have an abortion. Um, and she ends up in the hospital and then she ends up in the coffin. So the, vi the bad village healer has uh, led to her death. Now, it's a little bit later. I, I'm cheating a little bit on the time frames, but still, this is a trial of the woman healer from a, a mock trial um, that I wrote about in my second book. Um, Kurinicha, her name means the um, chicken one. She has the long nose, the toothless mouth, the long fingers, and the cauldron of Baba Yaga. So she takes from uh, folk figures instead of from icons. Um, and here one more, protect your child from infections. The woman here, it says, don't, uh, don't kiss your children on the lips, um, give them more air and sun. The good mother here uh, holds back the bad um, woman healer who is looking to kiss the baby on the lips. Um, and we see, some, I think, unmistakable racism. She's portrayed with darker skin, um, with old fashioned clothes against the background of the light and sun the, and the good mother. So we have um, some tension over the, the bad mother. Um, and then some shaming of women. Oh mama, if only you were literate, you could help me. The mother is wearing bast uh, shoes. The child is actually barefoot, uh, but no, she can't help her child because she herself is illiterate. Um, so toward the end of the 20s, you get somewhat more active women uh, celebrating March 8th, leaving behind the samovar, which is dragging women down, leaving behind the kitchen, um, freeing women from kitchen slavery. And then of course, an image that itself becomes iconic, um, the, the woman with the steely glance, she's, she's still, she doesn't move, she's against the factory. But, um, and her eyes are very prominent, which is important in iconography, but she is, um, she's completely still. And I think, I think that matters. So to conclude, by relying on Russian Orthodox Church in the construction of imagery during the Civil War, revolutionary artists who were supporting the new regime associated men with warrior saints who were forward-looking, while women were associated with either the saintliness of the Pieta or with Russia's backwardness and the witch figure. Although the new Soviet laws insisted on women's equality and even sameness of men, the posters told a different story. While heroic men looked forward, strode into the future, women as subjects of this propaganda were being shamed for their illiteracy and ignorance as they looked backward over their shoulders at the underdevelopment of the nation. In the end, one of the things I'm most interested in is the dissonance between written and visual messages, and which suggests that this dissonance suggests that maybe historians' traditional reliance on texts to the exclusion of visual materials may be giving us a distorted image, so to speak, of what people at the time may have been perceiving and concluding. Above all, we may want to ask how visual perceptions may have operated more directly than verbal texts and laws to reinforce previously held associations of both of women with both motherhood and backwardness and of men with military valor. So I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was great. Um, and now we'll turn to Anne Babra Pajal uh, and her work and to see how contemporary artists uh, wrestle with Russia's history. 
Well, thanks both of you. That was a fabulous presentation, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Amy, thank you for this fabulous exhibit that's going on right now. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, yep. And okay, we've got it, I think. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about the visual language I've developed in my art to portray my particular view based on my research as a Russian historian of the web of connection between individual human lives in Russia, the larger society, the autocratic government, and the land on which they live. As a quick introductory overview, oops, this is not working here. Oh, okay. As a quick introductory overview of my satirical art for those who haven't been to the museum, this is my largest completed polyptych, 14 feet long. A polyptych is a multi-paneled artwork made up of any number of pieces. This one is entitled Darling God Sonny, Ivan the Terrible Advises the Infant Stalin. And this is how I imagine Tsar Ivan advising the infant Stalin. That detail is from the first panel onion dome of the polyptych, it's right here. Um, which is now hanging at the Museum of Russian Icons. And here um, are a couple of details from different polyptics so that you will have an idea of what I'll be talking about. Elizabeth and I are each speaking today about art that is very consciously designed to communicate readily with viewers using different visual strategies or visual languages. Elizabeth has shown us how the artists who served the new Soviet government used centuries old gendered religious imagery that was already very familiar to the population. In my own particular art, I also happen to focus a lot on how I can communicate with viewers. I aim for my art to entice people of every kind and age to engage compassionately and realistically with my intensively researched out of the box view of Russian autocratic society and its history. From the time I start planning one of my comical but deadly serious polyptics, I make very conscious artistic choices that I hope will elicit this kind of response. I love when people really engage with my art, study it, crouch down the way these people are doing, take series of pictures of each panel, and most of all, talk with each other about it. My art has a point of view that I want to communicate so that people can bounce off it, reject it, or mull it over with other people. So today I'll talk first about the visual tools that I use initially to attract people to look at my art. Second, I'll talk about the visual tools I use to communicate the very complex relationship between individual Russians and that their society over five centuries. So to initially draw viewers in to my art, I use techniques from animation, graphic novels, comic books, and satirical political cartoons. We human beings tend to relate to the stories of individual people, not to masses of people. I'm suddenly seeing this Elizabeth within the context of your, <laughs> this woman here with her kids. Um, anyway, so we tend to relate to the stories of individual people, not to masses of people. As the saying goes, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. That same woman with the dead child is in the middle of this crowd scene. When playwrights or film directors want to make a general point about a society or a time in history, they tell the story of a single protagonist or a small group of people whose individual situation stands in for the broader picture. So as I began the process of painting my complicated theories about Russian autocratic society, I started by creating a frame of zany animated like characters 
designed to serve as amusing, rambunctious tour guides through these very complex, sometimes very sad paintings. I imagined flying godparents to the infant Stalin. So we have here Peter the Great, Ivan IV, often called the Terrible, and Catherine the Great. And I painted the infant Stalin swaddled with a mustache. Like many old fogies with a younger generation, my godparents pontificate about their worldly advice based on their own experience, their own life experience to a younger generation. In this imaginary case, the infant Stalin who actually lived centuries later. My godparents advise Stalin to follow their example for solutions when in his future, he experiences the same problems they did. Animation techniques play a major role in my art in general, including the recurrence of characters and scenes from one polyptych to the next, and even within the same polyptych. So here's a quick example from my triptych about Catherine the Great. Um, here, Catherine is spouting ide uh, enlightened ideas from Europe. She's sucked them in from Europe and she's spouting them out um, over the Russian peasantry. So they're floating out there, but without improving the peasantry's life at all. And then in the following scene in the same polyptych, Stalin in sheep's clothing is doing the exact same thing. He got Marxism from Europe. Getting back to my three flying godparents, I designed each of them as animation designers do. <clears throat> in my case, I imagined a personally appropriate way for each of my godparents to fly around Stalin's cradle. Peter the Great is famous for his passion for sailing ships and Western European technology. So I created him with wings made of sail, ship sails. My Peter dwarfs the ship he captains. If you've been to Moscow, you may recognize the influence on my design of this gigantic bizarre statue of Peter that was installed in the Moscow River in 1997. <clears throat> So my Catherine the Great's wings are made of heavy ornate gold together with the double-headed eagle, which is the symbol of the Russian empire. Catherine is famous for her lifelong correspondence with French enlightenment figures such as Montesquieu and Voltaire. So I painted her writing letters to them with her quill pen, which I gave her. Uh, meanwhile, in Russia, she actually intensified serfdom and restricted Jews to the pale. My Catherine character is equally hypocritical. Her magnificent gold wings are too heavy to fly. So she needs serfs on stilts to actually hoist her into the air. So um, Ivan IV is often called the terrible, though actually his methods of torture and execution were no more terrible than European methods at that time. He dramatically strengthened Russian autocracy through purges executed by his dreaded murderous secret police who each carried their two symbols, a broom and a severed dog's head on their saddles as they galloped across Russia raining down terror. When I combined these two symbols serendipitously, they created a cross between a hobby horse and a witch's broom a perfect way for my Ivan to fly. My approach to designing these characters is very influenced by satirical political cartoons of the 19th and early 20th centuries, Russian, European, and American, which I love. These cartoons use brilliant, broad caricatures to skewer the corrupt, self-aggrandizing actions of powerful elites. In my history PhD research, I had focused intensively on the daily lives of Russian workers. The sympathies of these early political cartoons were also with the laboring classes, but they focused not on workers or peasants, but on the moneyed and ruling classes and their agents who caused great suffering among the people under their control. What makes these cartoons comical 
is the ingenious metaphors artists invented to poke fun of elites, greed, and self-absorption. This approach was particularly appropriate for my art because I analyze how ruling classes amassed and consolidated power. The cartoons approach also provided me with rich ground for satire. I love this one of Teddy Roosevelt as a baby with a mustache. A last influence is the brilliant animated segments of the 1968 feature film, Charge of the Light Brigade, made at the height of the anti-Vietnam War movement. I wish I could show you some examples, but good clear images don't seem to exist outside the movie. So everybody should go try to see that movie. It's the 1968 one, not the other one. So each of my polyptics is organized around one or more of my godparents giving their advice to the infant in a combination of images and text arranged in a format similar to a comic book or graphic novel. My text appears in speech bubbles that contain my original lyrics um, written to the tune of Kalinka along with the music. So you see these speech bubbles. Um, in some polyptics, you simply read or sing, if you're in the mood, um, the speech bubbles and panels from left to right as you'd read a book. So here are all those speech bubbles. Um, in other polyptics, you follow numbered sections through, musical, through the musical narration. So uh, here's number one. So you sing these lyrics first and then number two and then number three. Um, so now I'll move on to looking at the large, unfanciful scenes I paint below the silly satirical animated characters. Each of my polyptics includes literally hundreds of people in crowd scenes. At first, these massive crowds seem to defy that rule that one person's life is riveting, a million people's lives are statistics. So I've been thrilled to find that viewers of all ages and backgrounds often get deeply absorbed in studying these huge crowd scenes for a long time, moving from panel to panel. I'm thrilled because the real heart of what I'm saying is in these big scenes, not in the animated czars who may initially draw you in. I suspect viewers study these details partly because I paint highly specific portrayals of individual people. There are no duplicates among my Russians. I use tiny brushes and a magnifying glass to paint each one to three inch high imaginary person as a unique portrait. So here's an example, um, this um, blue low level nobleman is kicking a member of another clan with his own very specific body language and facial expression. I'll tell you more in a minute about these clans. Here, people who are kneeling, oopsie, who are kneeling um, to form the all important foundation of the Green family clan hold their position solidly despite their great distress at being stomped on by a yellow clan nobleman. In these paintings, I'm actually portraying abstract human qualities, ambition, competitiveness, selfishness. But as an artist, I convey these abstract emotional states using physical actions, body language and facial expressions. I think these portraits draw viewers into the crowd scenes also because I paint each person at a moment of extreme effort to achieve their most crucial life goals. I capture each one in mid fall or mid tackle or at the apex of a kick. Sorry, we didn't get that tackle. There's the tackle um, or at the apex of a kick. I paint their faces in fleeting, unguarded moments when they reveal more of their inner hungers than when they're more self-possessed. 
No artist model can replicate such peak moments when posing because they'd fall on the ground or over a cliff or because such acute positions can't be held for longer than a split second. In all of my paintings, I want my models to be the exact opposite of a pose. I don't want self-conscious reenactments of intense moments. I want the real thing. So I create huge image banks of people fiercely doing activities that use similar body movements to what I want my paintings to express. So this soccer player here became this clan member. Uh, you can see he's in the exact same position with his hand here, this arm and so on. And this kid uh, kicking became this red clan member kicking him. Um, this process takes weeks of searching and brainstorming about what types of human activities involve the action I want to paint. In my art, when the viewer is ready, he or she can look beyond the individual portraits to see a wider perspective of each one's social context. The Russian nobility from the time of the rise of Muscovy was made up of family patronage clans in which powerful clan members at the top were raised up and supported in power by their less mighty relatives at the bottom. So as an example, uh, this is the yellow clan nobleman that I showed you just a minute ago, um, stomping on his green clan rivals. So this is what you saw a minute ago and here he is within the context of the whole painting. Um, and this green clan woman that you saw up here tackling the yellow clan person is way up here within the yellow clan. From the lowest noble clan members to the most potent top nobleman in Moscow, the visual vocabulary I use to represent differences in wealth and power is duller colors at the bottom of every clan and bright, very ornate fabrics at the top um, with gradations in between. These, uh, this clothing is getting more elaborate as it goes up. Um, and in addition, postures change from kneeling at the bottom to more upright stances in the middle um, to the top boyars rocketing themselves um, upward to grab the bottom of the czar's robe, competing for patronage to pass down to their lower relatives who form the base of support without which they couldn't stay on top. So here you're seeing again that yellow clan that we've been looking at. Um, and here's a slide of the czar with all those top nobles. I think another element that draws people into studying my art is that while portraits are individual, each person I paint is typical, typically interacting intently with other vitally important people in their lives. My family patronage clan relationships, you see them as supportive within the clan here people supporting each other, um, and are also shown in all their raw conflictual detail between clans. The battle sometimes, oh, uh, members of each clan battle to achieve dominance over other clans. The battle sometimes gets so vicious that people fall off the clan pyramid. Um, equally important, Oh yeah, so, so these are the, the ones who are falling here and here. Um, equally important, clan members help other clan members to rise. They're hoisting each other up here um, or form cross-clan alliances through marriage. This is doing something strange here, oops, okay. Um, so these are cross-clan alliances through marriage. Um, at, this is an orange clan member getting married to a yellow clan member and that will form an alliance. So stepping back even further for an even wider perspective, Ivan's panel one portrays the social structure of his entire society with Ivan at the top, 
Um, and each clan, which I portrayed using different colors, as you've seen, competing for influence and patronage from him. Peasants are at the, way down here at the bottom. I think viewers, even American children, are entranced by hierarchies because we all live our lives embedded in pecking orders and rankings. However unspoken a hierarchy may be, even children are aware of who holds some kind of power over them and who they may hold some kind of power over. Before I go further with the issue of visualizing Russian autocratic hierarchy, I want to talk for a minute about the visual vocabulary that has commonly been used to portray hierarchies all over the world. Um, this horizontal layers of people who do similar work, such as being a soldier, there are soldiers in here, um, or a worker or a religious authority, religious authorities here, um, or who own society's means of production, factory owners, corporations, and so on. This layered way of depicting societies may be accurate for some countries in the world, and it's been used for many countries. This is ancient Egypt here. Here we have contemporary Germany. And in fact, I used it uh, myself in the past to portray Russia in one of my earliest polyptics. Uh, here's its triangular shaped layering from the peasants at the bottom to the czar at the top. But as I began extensive research for Darling God, Sunny Stalin, I began to realize that for Russia, that layer cake visual vocabulary was completely inaccurate. From the time of the rise of Muscovy, the Russian autocratic power structure was made up of family-based patronage clans that more accurately should be painted vertically, not in horizontal layers. So now we'll take a much quicker look at a couple of other large panels in this polyptych. We always think of the Russian Revolution as a huge break with the past. But as I was painting, I had a hunch that if we looked more at the social history of Russia, rather than its political, political and ideological history, we might find a break not quite as all encompassing as we thought. After another six months of dogged research with fantastic help finally from Arch Getty, the Russian historian whose book on Bolshevik clans was published at the end of that six month uh, period, I had my hunch confirmed that bizarrely enough, after the 1917 revolution, patronage clans formed all over again. These were not family-based as were the clans in Tsar Ivan's time, but they were patronage clans in which the top members contended for resources from the Kremlin to hand down to their lower clan supporters. I portrayed the similarities between the 16th and 20th century clans by painting them almost identically. For example, this is the bottom half of the blue clan in Ivan's time and in Stalin's. Um, in each, a strong foundation supports other clan members who help still others rise up toward the Kremlin, the font of all patronage. We won't have time today to talk about all the complex reasons patronage clans developed again after the revolution. I'll describe two visual language problems that faced me when I began painting this panel. First, how could I paint gradations of status, power, and wealth within each Bolshevik clan at a time when everyone's clothing was more or less the same? For Tsar Ivan's clans, I had painted top boyars gloriously dressed while the lowest nobility was much plainer. But there was no such clothing distinction between top Bolsheviks and the lowest clan members in the 1920s that I could paint in a way that would be quickly readable to viewers. In the first few years after the revolution, which sprang from economically disastrous World War I, 
and was immediately followed by a brutal, devastating three-year civil war across most of Russia. Housing and food were so scarce that it was an elite privilege just to have a small apartment and food to eat regularly. So I considered painting material items like that along, uh, alongside my clan portraits to indicate wealth gradations. But these simple luxuries would not convey to a modern audience the sharp differences that were already arising along the clan continuum. This visual problem got me really depressed because I had started painting this huge project without knowing clearly what the other four panels would look like. When I started, I decided to just have faith the panels would all work out. But here was a problem that really stymied me and made me feel I wouldn't be able to finish painting something I'd already put so much work, time, and emotional investment into. <clears throat> Finally, in conversations with a sculptor friend, Margie Cohen, it dawned on me that the wealth the Soviet elite had access to in the immediate post-war, post-revolutionary years actually derived from the vast riches that had been appropriated for centuries by the czarist regime and concentrated at the top, which was then seized by the Bolshevik government astounding stores of gold, jewels, palaces, Fabergé eggs, and on and on. So painting Zara's treasure in all its glory was my solution. But how could I show that this wealth was concentrated at the top of the Bolshevik hierarchy as the glorious clothes of Tsar Ivan's boyars showed in my first panel? The solution was to paint and collage it piled up and locked behind Kremlin-like walls here. Um, it was the proceeds from that centralized wealth that Bolshevik, and here's the uh, entire finished panel. You can see that concentration of wealth here. Um, so I did something similar for panel five, in which Stalin is at the height of his power. By now he had control over wealth created by the Soviet people over decades. By this time, elite's wealth was literally kept hidden behind closed doors and inside the tinted windows of official limousines, like these, um, and the walls of exclusive housing communities. So again, I painted it behind the same metaphoric walls as I had in panel two. Here's a close up of some of those Soviet era luxury items. A last important visual element of how I created panel two in Stalin's early days was that I wanted to indicate his control over hiring people to carry out the directives of the top Bolshevik leaders. If you'd like more on the history of how Stalin wound up with so much control over the jobs patronage pyramid, please watch the recording of the other Zoom program about my art, which will be on the museum website. For now, I'll just say that I needed a way to portray this visually, and I did it by placing Stalin on and in front of a lot of collaged, old-fashioned wooden file cabinets, on which I placed labels of all departments and types of jobs that had to be filled. So heavy industry, construction, and all this steel, chemicals, dams, et cetera. Um, we won't have time to go deeply into panels three to five, but I mentioned the important new, um, but I'll mention that the important new visual vocabulary here includes ladders, and skeletons. If you'd like to know more about either one, please ask during the discussion. Uh, so here are the ladders uh, closer up um, and a few of the skeletons. Why did patronage clans and autocratic rule develop twice in Russia's history? Geographers often describe Russia 
as the least defensible country on earth because of its vast flat plains with no natural barriers to protect it. And I'm gonna zoom in on the map in that painting to show you how different Russia is geographically from any other place on earth with its endless flat expanse far larger than anywhere else on the globe, coupled with some of the most powerful enemies on earth along their entire open frontier a longer unprotected border than any other country has. And Russia has a relatively small population to defend that very long border. In comparison, the United States is far more protected by oceans east and west and less powerful countries north and south. Many people are familiar with the horrendous toll World War II took on the Soviet Union, as you can see from this chart. Here we are with the statistics. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, yeah, you can see that the Soviet Union lost a far higher percentage of its pre-war population than did the United States or even France. But few Americans are aware of other powerful invaders over history including the huge toll taken on the early inhabitants of this wide open land by Tatar and other slave traders over hundreds of years before Catherine the Great. Almost every summer for centuries, slave traders, slave raiders rode in from the South to kidnap Slavs, these are the Slavs, um, and march them in chains back across the steppe to the Crimean slave markets. Historian Peter Brown has estimated that over the 800 years prior to the end of the 18th century, about 20 million Slavs were abducted to be sold into slavery, many of them as slaves in Europe. Because of this, our word, our word slave and the Spanish esclavo and the French esclave all derived from Slav. For centuries, slaves in Europe were Slavs. So in the absence of protective barriers like steep mountains or huge oceans, Russia has always had to create a human barrier against invaders and raiders. And this is how I painted that situation with autocracy gleefully opening the fortress of its robes for the Russian population to seek protection inside. Gerald Easter, a political scientist whose brilliant book about early Bolshevik elite patronage networks describes how similar they were <clears throat> to the centuries old Russian elite druzhinas as they're called in Russian because they were warriors and also government administrators, a dual role. Easter described them as a warrior elite who assisted the prince in governing his realm. I suspect that clans are vertical because they derive from Dujinas, because <clears throat> Russia is so wide open to invasion from many sides, the autocratic chain of command remains in place as the country stays eternally prepared and on the alert to defend itself at a moment's notice. So as you can see in these last few images, I've been experimenting since I began creating these polyptics with finding a visual language to convey Russian geography's impact on its tendency to return to autocracy over the last millennium. I've often used maps, but I don't think they resonate with most viewers the way I wish them to, um, maybe because they don't have pictures of people. So the polyptic I'm painting now, Peter the Great's advice to the infant Stalin, focuses around an eight foot wide map of the entire world with each continent full of my painted scenes of what Europe and Russia were doing in Peter's time when Europe was exploring and exploiting the riches of the so-called new world. I hope you'll stay tuned to see that polyptic when it's finished. So in conclusion, what does it matter whether we have an 
accurate understanding of Russia's autocratic social structure over the past five centuries. What difference does it make? Well, for one thing, today in Russia, we have autocratic clan structure version, clan structure version 3.0 under Putin. I'm not an expert in the powerful oligarchs clans that resurfaced or that surfaced after the end of Soviet communism. I do know enough to say that they stand in a more or less similar relationship to the new autocratic leader, Putin. So for my last Onion Dome in this polyptic, I collaged a photo of Putin with his own top clan members happily surrounding him as he smiles slyly back over Russia's history, knowing that like my infant Stalin, he is the recipient of whatever it is in Russia that brings autocratic rulers such remarkable success there. So there we go. And now I stop share. Okay. Thank you, Anne, uh, for that fascinating dive into your art. Um, I highly recommend for those of you attending today who are local uh, to visit the museum, see these in person, um, because the images, you know, virtually just don't do them justice. And, um, you know, I wish, so wish we were able to have this program in person. Um, I think it would open up a great dialogue. We could go up into the gallery, but you know, such as life right now. Uh, so we'll give everybody a minute to kind of collect their thoughts. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A section. Um, but I believe, Anne, uh, you had a question for Elizabeth, so we I can do. start off with that. Right, right. Okay. You know, and I think this is maybe because I spent so much time thinking about how people are going to receive and read my art. So I'm wondering what the heck were the Bolsheviks thinking about how women would receive that backward, the, these backward images of themselves? Were the artists aiming to make men feel better? Um, were, you know, that they were the heroes ahead of women or were they telling women to stay back, stay back in their places or what, what were they doing? <laughs> it seems kind of odd. When you need it all hands on deck during the Civil War, right? Right. I think that's a great question. I mean, I think part of it is that they they weren't doing this consciously. You know, for them, they needed heroic men all to the front to fight, and they couldn't imagine women serving in any role besides in the family. And they and when they thought of the family, they thought of backwardness. So you know, rush. I at one point started looking at Russian proverbs, and there's a million proverbs about the backwards baba, the backward woman. Her path is from the 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 stove to the threshold you know she's never seen the outside world she knows nothing and the other thing of course is that in in, in visual images as you've just so beautifully shown and you have to use shorthand right mm -hmm. so I think they often and and I've thought well maybe I shouldn't you know I I'm, I'm telling all my trade secrets here the thing I, I you know that um, shows the weakness of my argument potentially is to say well they just showed women as peasants they had they had the two genders and they had workers and peasants so they show women as peasants and the men as uh, workers but the fact is that um, there, I have found no bad fathers. Um, there are some images of men as alcoholics, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Um, there are definitely some men as illiterate, but even when they're illiterate, they're, there's a famous one of, him, of a man stepping off a cliff. He's still um, much more vigorous. So I'm not sure. The other thing is, I think this is important for us as historians, right? We also have to be a little bit careful that um, while I might say that the public-private split is problematic because it relegates women to the private sphere and men to the public sphere, we have to remember that in orthodoxy, the mother of God is second only to the Christ. So it's not that the, the female sphere was necessarily bad, but it is definitely the one where they saw the most problems. They're not going to critique the army because they need them to fight and they need to fight without question. They need to feel heroic. Um, I think they didn't have an image of women as heroic mothers, although that will change. Um, in 1941, the most famous, one of the most famous post posters is um, the um, the motherland is calling you is a very powerful woman calling to men and women to, to do everything for the war effort. So 
I think it's 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 fairly nuanced. And of course, um, I have my own schematic problems in presenting this as a as a talk. I you can't go into all the details that I would uh, normally. But I think that's a great question, Anne. And I I think for them, they didn't think of this, the domestic sphere as necessarily um, problematic, but they did they did certainly worry about all the signs of Russia's backwardness. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they couldn't imagine that you know, unlike Mao, who took uh, had a positive view of peasants, they had not, not nothing positive to say about peasants, and very little positive in that way to say about women. So that's an interesting question. Yeah, and it's an interesting uh, series of you know the way you, that you're thinking about answering it. So it's great. Yeah. Great. Um, so we'll uh, jump to a question that was submitted uh, earlier this morning. Um, so I think it'll be a fairly quick answer. Did poster artists continue to draw on any elements of Russian Orthodox iconography in posters created after Stalin's consolidation of power, particularly in the mid 1930s through the Great Patriotic War? Mm. I haven't worked on that topic. Um, what I have noticed is that women are much more active in the 30s. They are driving tractors. They are going into the collective farms. Um, that's where they're supposed to go. As I mentioned, there's a fam very famous image of women calling on the entire nation to fight. Um, but whether they borrow from Russian Orthodoxy, I don't know yet. Um, it may be that the Civil War is this unusual moment um, and it doesn't, doesn't continue, that they're developing, but that they needed to develop their own icons. Um, they developed their own socialist realism, their own ways of thinking of things. Right. So. That, that'll be uh, part two of your talk. <laughs> yeah, it looks like somebody in the chat just commented, um, often Saint Xenia is depicted in icons in an army coat which in the tradition of the Holy Foals, she is quite simple and also fits in with the backward glance mentioned. Um, no, I think that's very interesting to look at, at those images. Um, that's a great comment. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, so kind of continuing this theme uh, of women, uh, this one question asks, uh, women frequently are the people who make traditional crafts for the home. I saw Ukraine indicated with U uh, Ukrainian stitchery. Are other traditional crafts used to show culture or women's sphere either positively or negatively in Bolshevik propaganda images? Hmm. Um, definitely there was a ton of new craftsmanship. There were um, plates and bowls and porcelain that um, took up a lot of the um, imagery inspired by uh, Marc Chagall and Larionov and some of the other high artists, um, they brought in in those uh, com combination of crafts and uh, imagery for sure. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, this next question is for Anne. On one of the polyptic panels of the Bolshevik plans, <clears throat> it looks like the clan members are pulling people up from the lower classes. Is that is that is what's happening? Uh, was there the feeling that even the lower classes could rise in hierarchy if they gave their loyalty to a Bolshevik clan? Yeah, well, that's actually something that um, if I had had more, you know, if I had infinite time, I would have talked about that. They are, yes, those are being, those people are being pulled up from, you know, um, from the laboring classes. Um, and and that so that was something which we could see as a new kind of change from the czarist period that some people could begin to break over that that barrier but i think what's important is to um uh remember that they're or to realize that they were rising as individuals they were not rising you know sometimes we think of a peasants revolution or a workers revolution these people were rising as individuals, um, not as, as part of whole classes that were sort of working in their own interests as a group that was pushing for their own interests. They were feeding up into those individual, you know, as individual parts of the clan structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it is a big, um, important, um, you know, if you want to know more about that, Sheila Fitzpatrick has her book on education under Stalinism. I've forgotten the exact name. Maybe you know Elizabeth, but um, it, uh, it it really she has some wonderful descriptions of how people were able to pull themselves up um, by going to school and um, 
Yeah, moving up. Yeah, she, she talks about terror and upward mobility, which I used to be skeptical of, but I do think it makes a great difference if you can. And I think that's one of the things I love about your clans, Anne, is that you can you can see them pulling themselves up, but to get up in this somewhat zero sum situation, you're also showing how they have to push other people down, right? Yeah. <laughs> send people off to the gulag to create that vacancy that then you can occupy or your brother-in-law can occupy or something. Else. Right. Right. And actually that's a lot of what, um, what that entire polyptic is about is, and, and the, the big central panel, which I didn't talk about at all today is about the horrendous purges, um, which Ivan did the exact same thing during his time as Stalin did. I mean, it was the identical purges. It's, it's just extraordinary to realize how similar they were. And the, the upshot of those purges was not only that you got rid of, you know, this individual and that, and, you know, the people who you didn't want there and exiled them eastward or killed them or whatever, um, but also that as you pulled out those people from the clan hierarchies, you were creating a way for people, for people from lower down to rise up into those positions that earlier would have been held by um, the people who were who were in those positions before. I'm not being too articulate here. But again, and, and Sheila Fitzpatrick talks about this wonderfully. I mean, that these people then became very loyal to Stalin because he had raised them up. And it didn't, you know, they weren't thinking that, well, I got raised up because that other guy, you know, six notches above me got sent off to the gulag and I got to move up the ladder along with the entire chain of people above me. So, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, Anne, if you will want to do a uh, Putin era set of triptychs. There's a new Eurasia movement that has uh, idealizes Ivan the Terrible and the Aprishnina, those exactly the, the dog's head um, witches brooms that you draw so well. Yeah. They, are, they have a, a Eurasian movement and a youth movement connected to it that that is arguing we have to clean out Russia. We have to, it's sort of like clean, clean the Russian version of the swamps and it's okay to use violent methods. Um, uh, otherwise it'll get stagnant and ingrown. But the fact of the matter is that it's definitely what's missing here is any sense of rule of law. <laughs> minor detail, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, uh, no, I mean, I, if, I, if I knew more about um, oligarchs clan since the fall of the Soviet Union, I definitely would have included i mean it's clear that this is happening again so but they're providing their own visual materials for you if you go to the website called Tsargrad, which means the czar city uh -huh. you will find they have they've created images of it too so anyway that that's a fun idea yeah. <laughs> thank you <laughs> your, your polyptic can just keep growing and growing <laughs> it'll get to be 28 feet right <laughs> right so with this idea of sort of upward mobility, um, this one question asks, uh, Anne, do the ladder images in your work have any reference to the ladder images in traditional icons? Ooh. The ladder images in my work, meaning? So the ladders and, you know, I'm thinking- oh, Ladder, ladder. Oh, wow, that's an interesting question. I, I didn't intend them to, but that is, and I mean, I know that I'm always kind of attracted to those ladders and icons. Um, I, I don't, it wasn't, if it, if it, if they are, it wasn't conscious. I was trying to think of a way to show that people are able to run, that they are getting now new ladders for advancement up the hierarchy that they didn't have before the purges. So that's really, um, that, that's how I was thinking. Uh, these next two questions I'm going to somewhat combine since they're they're related. Uh, we are fortunate to be able to hear from the artist about her intent. Uh, is there anything in the archives that helps us understand what the what the artists and the government propaganda organizations were thinking or directives given to them uh, from leadership? And to kind of go along with that, uh, how was the government using these propaganda posters? Where would they be seen? 
So the, that's the next step, step of my research is, you know, now that I've sort of convinced myself that this really is a topic that, that um, there's been a lot written about the icons and there's been a lot written about the posters, particularly the posters as the, in the image of the blacksmith. Um, there's been a lot written about the image of women as um, workers or peasants, but there hasn't, this combination of the icons and the posters, I think hasn't been done. So, um, but I haven't actually gone to the archives yet. Um, I know that the state archives have a poster collection and they have, and the art, the um, archive of literature and art also has uh, materials relating to the artists. So that's the next step is to go find the biographies and the um, letters of these artists. How did they think about what they were doing? I mean, I, that's why I, I tried to be very clear at the beginning of this. That I don't know uh, all that depth of information. How they were used, we do know a lot. There were um, agitation trains that went out into the countryside. There were agitation, there were posters um, glued to the public uh, public buildings all over. Um, and, it, and again, they were, they were used more than any Anything else I think to mobilize people, to get people to support the regime, to, pe to put up with the hardships. Because the, the other thing that I, the other reason that I'm interested in this, is I, I'm particularly interested in this, does it harden gender differences at a point when they're supposed to be decreasing those gender differences? But the other reason I'm interested in this because I think today um, regimes both in Russia itself and also in Eastern Europe are using heightened emotions to get people to uh, be excited about the taking of Crimea. Or in Poland, there's a ton of imagery right now of the Poles as the great martyrs of World War II. They are the Christ crucified. And I think, I think that I, without denigrating people's experiences, I think they're drawn to these heightened emotions because of this long history of the Orthodox Church that says you can have this exalted sense of God by looking through the icon. And so that you need that visual material. That's part of what they were used was, so you would think about the heroic status of the warrior and you wouldn't think about the fact that you didn't have bread. So you could create these amazing, the Soviet Union created amazing things. The Moscow Metro of 1936, you know, Sputnik, um, at, you know, we could go on and on. Literacy itself was, was a phenomenal effort. And so you look, Look at literacy and you don't think about the mud and the uh, lack of food and the famines and so on you think of the exalted history and so i think that's part of how they were intended was to to create this heightened set of emotions that's so, really interesting yeah and and i think we all as people to who you know we, we're, uh, we're always being addressed that way in different cultures um, at different times, but how do we avoid the twin dangers of, you know, panic and uh, fear mongering around what the enemy will do and also heightened calls to, um, you know, it's not that we shouldn't support whatever causes we believe in, but we need to look at our own emotional responses. Um, and, the, and, the, and I think it's so interesting to see the way visual materials are, don't have nuance because they can't. I mean, it's part of the nature of the beast. So I, I, they were used. They were used all over the place um, in every organization. The other thing that's really interesting for uh, the icon uh, Soviet connection is that in uh, every peasant house would have had a red corner, and that was where they kept their icons. Every Soviet institution created red corners as well. Only instead of having um, Religious icons, they now have pictures of Lenin and Stalin. I have, I've had quotes from Kalantai, who was a feminist saying, yes, of course they had my image up. It's to motivate people. And the saints' lives had been a key for uh, teaching uh, people in pre-revolutionary times. It was the one book that peasants might have or might have read. Now we have the lives of revolutionaries. So that the revolutionaries of the 19th century, the, and, then, and then the life of Lenin, the life of Stalin to motivate people too. So. That, that uh, creating socialist saints and socialist martyrs. In 1919, they had a huge celebration in the field of Mars in Petrograd around the people who had died for the revolution. They don't continue it as, with as much religiosity because they're really trying to become more atheistic. But I, I do think they, they were well aware. They wanted to, to get at people through their heartstrings. Oh, ab absolutely. And um... I know uh, for a couple of us who tour the museum, uh, you know, that's something that we like to talk about as well in conjunction with the red or beautiful corner. Um, because you mentioned Poland, uh, this person was hoping that you could um, explain just a little bit more about uh, the poster uh, with Poland and Ukraine uh, and what specifically it related to. Was it the revolution, the Russo-Polish war? Perhaps it's, both? Yeah, it's the Soviet-Polish war, 1920, 1921, when Petliura's forces attacked 
the Soviet Union or, or young nascent Soviet Russia, and they were terrified that the Poles would, as they had in the time of troubles in the 17th century, that they would take over. Um, they they would again take over Russia, and Russia would be destroyed. So it was. It's also a class. There's a, also a class play that had been done over and over again in Russian history to separate, especially by revolutionaries, to separate ordinary Ukrainians who are more tended to be working class or peasants from upper class Poles and make the Poles the bad guys. So then the Ukrainians become the martyr, the innocent, the victims. So the Ukrainians are portrayed as, as the female figure. So yes, definitely, absolutely you guessed it right on. It is does relate to the war. So we just have uh, just a, a, another minute or two left. Um, so we'll close out uh, with this question for Anne. Uh, there were several major peasant revolts such as, and I apologize, I'm probably going to mispronounce these, uh, such as the Pugachev and Stenka Razin rebellions, uh, then in the 1930s rebellions against collectivization. Um, have you considered how to include them in your representation? You know, there's so much to include in any portrayal of, of Russian history. I, I was asked once, why did I not, you know, consider the famines during, during why are they not in there? Well, I, you know, it's, there, there is a limit. You can see that my art is a little bit crowded already, but, um, yeah, you know, it would be great to, I've, I've always loved those peasant rebellions. I remember in graduate school, I was very, uh, you know, collected books about them and I, I do love them um, or I was very interested in them. Um, they, you know, maybe one thing to say about them is that they ultimately did not succeed. They were not powerful enough for various reasons to destroy this hierarchy that, you know, that I painted on every panel. Great. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll conclude the program. Uh, Anne, Elizabeth, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, I thought this was a great talk. Uh, this lecture uh, is being recorded, so it'll be available on our website, I, I would say within about a week or so. Um, and to everyone attending today, have a happy Thanksgiving, stay safe, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye all. Thanks so much.